you might ask why we need another way of teaching. Teaching Unplugged challenges, um, in some ways, does the opposite of some of the key principles in orthodox, conventional, linear teaching. So instead of all the focus being on planning, planning is part of our work, but we also need to record and map what has emerged in the classroom. So the planning is lighter, it's less intensive, but there's intensive work that follows. It's not an easy solution. Instead of essentially delivering top-down material, which is mandated in a syllabus or expressed in the course book, we want to bring to the surface the learner's needs in terms of language, interests in terms of their lives. So we use conversation or interaction as the way to surface this, bring it to life. And that allows us to attend to the language that they know, the language that they want to use, that they're reaching for, and also perhaps to gaps in their knowledge, which persist, even though in theory, we've covered off some of those verb forms or some of those vocabulary areas that are still causing trouble. Well, I think that Teaching Unplugged helps you develop as a teacher in quite similar ways to the ways in which it helps learners develop because it provides a different kind of challenge. It provides a challenge that interests us, that engages us, but which keeps us on our toes and which means that we need to make decisions in the moment and that not everything can be planned in advance. Teaching in all kinds of areas, in all kinds of non-school environments is very organic. If you think about the way that we teach children to do things or the way that we show a colleague how to do something, we don't make a plan for it. We don't write down exactly what we're going to tell so-and-so in the office about how to make better PowerPoint slides. Um, we don't plan how we're going to teach our kids to ride a bike. We kind of get them on the bike, or we see them in front of their computer screen, we see what they're able to do, and then we help them to do it better. And we respond to the particular difficulties they, they encounter. And if they suddenly start learning quicker, then we can deal with that as well. To teach Unplugged involves really paying attention to what's happening in the here and now. It involves really being present as you interact with learners and as you listen to how they're interacting and what that tells you about their language needs. So it's highly motivating. It means that we're not ever going to be doing the same lesson twice. I've heard teachers talking about doing the same year twice or many times because they're using the same materials. If we unplug, if we allow each group of learners to generate their own content, then we're always going to be engaged ourselves and so are they. So I would see the development as a teacher and the development for the learners as being really intertwined here. And it's about a kind of letting go, if you like. At some point, if we're teaching a child how to ride a bike, we have to kind of push them off. And we know they're going to fall off and they might hurt themselves, um, hopefully not too badly, but we know that's going to happen. It's just part of the process. And we kind of deal with our own tension as parents or carers. And then we deal with 
how the child reacts to falling off. Well, that's a great question. Um, I think very often we pass on the knowledge that we acquire. And so if in our initial teacher training, the lesson plan was at the center of everything and of every moment in the classroom, it's natural that we should carry that with us. Um, and so the idea that the lesson plan has to be complete, has to anticipate everything that's going to happen in the class becomes self-perpetuating and it can become a norm that it's hard for, to challenge both in our own practice and when it comes perhaps to observing other teachers or sharing experience with other teachers. That's looking at it from a, a kind of emotional perspective, uh, uh, a you know teacher development perspective, if you like. If we've been told that something is really important, is central, is essential in a particular form, then it can be hard to challenge that. And if we're tense, if we experience a setback, if we have <clears throat> a class that's more difficult than another one, it's easy to kind of fall back, if you like, on the norm and to seek comfort in the norm. There's a much broader question here, which relates to control. It relates to learning objectives and learning outcomes, not just within a lesson plan or within a group of learners, but to how those are managed within a community of learners as a school, and also how those are managed in the context of a national school network. Um, because the idea that very tightly controlled lesson planning is effective and necessary is deeply ingrained in our public education culture or in the public discourse about education, the kind of things that education ministers and government say. It again becomes a sort of self-perpetuating truism that effective planning leads to effective teaching, leads to effective outcomes. Now, Teaching Unplugged has never suggested there should be no planning. And in the book Teaching Unplugged, there are lots of examples of ways to set up activities, to set up whole lessons and sequences of lessons. In any case, as our workshop has, I think, demonstrated and explored, very often we're working in sync with or in step with the linear syllabus anyway. But I believe that the levels of control that are applied to everyday classroom interaction, if you like via the lesson plan, but from a whole top down infrastructure, are much too tight, are constraining, and make it much harder to explore the needs and interests of the learners. That doesn't just apply to English language teaching. So I think a lesson plan is useful. I think it can be much more minimal than the ones that we often are taught to prepare. I don't think it should be prepared months in advance or weeks in advance. I think it should be a rolling process of responding to the previous lesson and imagining the next lesson. Perhaps imagining is a nice counterbalance to planning. We're imagining what's gonna happen. We're thinking, I'll start with that. I think it's gonna lead there. I can probably link it to this part of the exam syllabus, for example. Then we can come back to the course book because I know that we need to cover that off and I need to give evidence that we've done that. But I think there might be room for something else which is going to engage the students more. So almost reimagining the curriculum or reimagining the syllabus on that micro level of one lesson to the next is a nice counterbalance to the idea of 
planning everything in strict detail and to strict timings.